out here for the first time, the first time through CPS. Okay, okay, good. It's always nice to have new people come. Um, how many people here who are not Glenbard but are from elsewhere? Not Glenbard people. Lovely. Special welcome to all of you. Wherever you come from, whatever organization or school, please, please spread the word. This, we have empty chairs. We shouldn't ever have an empty chair. So everybody's welcome. There's never any registration, there's never any fee, so please spread the word. So um, what's coming up? Well, here we are looking at the end of the year and really excited already about what's coming up next year. But just to finish off, we've got a program on April 14th, we'll be talking about careers, what parents need to know. Um, and then two programs coming up at the end of April, we call, we're calling it Taste of GPS Youth, the Maps You Live In. Uh, we're showing you this film, a film screening. We've got a great discussion afterwards by the author of Lost Boys, John Garbarino. He's going to lead the discussion. What is that society doing to boys, and what can we do about it? What do we need to know? Um, this is a program we just added, so it's not in the brochure. Richard Sheridan has written a book called Joy Inc. He has an organization. Uh, he's the president and a CEO of Menlo Industries, which has really revolutionized the workplace and made it a place of joy. So he'll be talking about joy in the home. So the flyers are on their way here, so don't leave without picking one of them up. Um, also, evaluations, please let us know if you want to be on the reminder list. Write very legibly, please, so we can uh, follow up and put you on the list and keep you posted about any additions. Also, as we're looking to next year, it'd be really interesting to hear any thoughts that you have about presentations that you think would be interesting to you and, and your friends and family. Um, I'd like to introduce Katie from Tate. Do you have Rosio? Oh, I don't want him introduced. Yeah. <laughs> As Gilda said, I'm Steve Hunter. I'm, uh, one of my roles is Director of Professional Education at Alexis Brothers Behavioral Health Hospital. Um, we do a lot of these. I've been there 17 years. I think we do about 100 to 150 presentations on a, a lot of different topics in a lot of different settings every year. So if I think about the last 15 years, that's an awful lot of people. So we appreciate appreciate you guys coming out today on a 60 mile an hour wind day out there. It, is, it might be, a, I don't even think a kite would work today. <laughs> Does anybody here know anybody that's ever had an ounce of anxiety? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're done. We were good, yeah. <laughs> uh, Found the right place. Maybe, no, yeah, maybe. maybe. Yeah, no. And, no. and the OCD answer card, which is a really practical kind of hands-on Q&A about obsessive compulsive disorder and what it is and what it isn't and sort of how to handle it. So it's a nice reference book for not only professionals, parents, uh, people who are dealing with that as an issue. Um, Dr. McGrath's been on a number of radio shows. He's been on the Learning Channel, um, featured on the show Borders. 
Not as the hoarder, by the way. Yeah. Not, yeah. Not, yeah. Not, yeah. As, yeah. not as the hoarder. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you all for coming, appreciate it. And we'll spend the next couple of hours here discussing stress, stress management, anxiety, what it is, why we have it, how it works, uh, what we can do about it, and uh, kind of go from there. If you have questions along the way, please feel free to ask. I'm happy to discuss uh, anything anxiety related, be it school anxiety, school refusal, or OCD, or trauma, or anything like that. So as we go through today, if something that we start to talk about kind of sets off something in your head that you wanted to ask about, please don't be afraid to do so. Just a few things to start us off. We know this. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental health problem that there is. So about one out of every four people will meet criteria for an anxiety disorder at some point in time in their life. So if you're here with three friends and they seem calm, <laughs> it's you, <laughs> just so you know. Okay? Now, many times anxiety disorders will come across in their, some of their most common forms, of course, which would be like a specific phobia where people will often just kind of learn to live with it. They're afraid of flying, so they just don't do it. They drive. They're afraid of heights, so they don't go to tall places. If they go on vacation to the Grand Canyon, they stay 50 feet back while you go lean over the edge and go, wow, this is really cool. All right, those people who have just kind of learned to accommodate a lot of that. But we also see a lot of specific phobia, especially with kids, in the anxiety program. Does anyone want to guess maybe what the most common specific phobia we treat is at, at our clinic? If you had to, if you had to guess. Test yes? Anxiety. Test anxiety, all right. Public speaking, I heard. Hmm? Social, anxiety. Social anxiety, okay. Social anxiety is a diagnosis of its own, so we're not going to call that a specific one. We'll talk about that one, though. But in terms of very specific phobia, the most common one we treat is the fear of vomit. Yep, it's called the metaphobia. We've got four people in the clinic right now with it. <coughs> vomit, throwing up, puke, barf, bleh, all that, all right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. And now many of you feel a little nauseous as I've said that. So. That Taco Bell's not sitting so well suddenly. Yeah, right? yeah. So. And then there's more serious kind of diagnosable problems like obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety disorder, trauma, those types of things, post-traumatic stress, acute stress, those, those things. We'll go through lots of different parts of that today. And then there's kind of a new phenomenon as well, too, in the way that anxiety disorders are coming across, and that is through school anxiety and school refusal. Okay. Now, this didn't really exist when I was a kid. Even though I was an anxious child, which is funny that I run an anxiety disorder program now, but um, my mom would wake me up every morning and just say, go puke, because I threw up pretty much every day of first grade. So she would wake me up and say, all right, go throw up, and I would walk in the bathroom, blah. <laughs> I didn't have fear of vomit, obviously. <laughs> And uh, then she'd take me to school. Now, sometimes I threw up in the Nova, but, you know, it was a 71 Nova with rusty floorboards. You just hose that thing down, and it vinyl seats, it's fine. She'd bring me back home, put a new uniform on me, bring me back to school. And then inevitably, there'd be the phone call from school that said, he threw up again, and uh, the room once again smells like sawdust, thanks to your son, <laughs> you know. And, so my mom would always ask, D does he have a fever? And, and the answer was always, well, no. And her response was, great, then he can stay at school. She never once come, went to get me, which was the best decision she could have made. The worst decision she could have made was, I'll be right there. And I'll get him, and I'll bring him home, and I'll make him soup, and I'll make sure that everything's fine and great. Because what would I have learned? Well, this pays off very nicely. 
This is really good. So over time, I learned I wasn't going home. And then my parents had parent-teacher conference and, and uh, the teacher's yelling at them because the room stinks all the time. And, and uh, my mom, who's kind of a fiery red-headed lady, says to the teacher, well, why don't you just be nice to him tomorrow? <laughs> and the teacher said, what? And uh, my mom said, yeah, when he gets here tomorrow, just say hi. It's good to see you. Let's have a good day. And she did, and I never threw up again after that day. Sometimes the smallest of interventions can make the biggest of influences on our lives. Which is one reason this is called don't try harder, try different, because we keep thinking we just got to try harder, and as long as we try harder, everything gets better. But what if we try harder at something that's not working? What's going to happen? Right, frustration. It's just not going to work that much more. So trying harder is not the thing to do. Sometimes we need to do something else. Sometimes we need to do something different. Okay? So that's really what we're going to focus on today, is what is it that we can do that will be different than what we've done in the past? And how can we make some of these small little changes in people's lives to help them? Now, lots of things have changed since all of us went to school. How many of you would have said to your parents, you know, today I'm not going to go to school? <laughs> Exactly, right. Because the wooden spoon would have come out of my house from the drawer and I would have been chased about the house until I was out and ready to go to school. And yet, one of the most common experiences now for kids is not going to school. And why don't they go to school? They don't go to school because they're anxious. And what is one of the fundamental mistakes lots of families make? They say to themselves, wow, I really don't want my kid to be uncomfortable. I want them to be as comfortable as they possibly can. And if they're telling me that going to school is uncomfortable, you know what I need to do? I need to make sure they don't go to school because I want them to be comfortable. I have a philosophy of treatment which is, I need you to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. I need you to learn how to handle what it is that bothers you because once you learn how to handle what bothers you, it won't bother you anymore. Why? You'll have learned how to handle it. Turns out, it's harder sometimes to treat the family members than it is the kid because it's harder for family members to look at their child being uncomfortable because you feel responsible and you think there's something wrong. Why isn't my kid 100% comfortable and feeling great? I don't know any kid that's ever been 100% comfortable and felt great. Okay? Every generation says, my kid should have it a little bit easier than I had it. Our generation had it the easiest that it needed to get. It didn't need to get easier. There's been so many studies out that are fascinating to me. There's a psychologist who in the 70s was out in the northeast section of the country in a small little New England town, and you know what he did? He followed people in the town for a month, and he followed their kids for a month. Uh, and what he found was those kids traveled, like on average, five to seven miles a day. They got on their bikes in the morning, they rode down to the river, they went swimming, they came back for lunch, they went back out again, they came back home for dinner, they went out again, and when the street lights came on, they knew they had five minutes to get home. He's now back in the same town, and he's following the kids of those kids. And when he interviews those kids, you know what they say? We don't leave the yard. We stay inside. We text our friends. We don't go interact with them. How many of you just woke up in the morning and walked out and walked to your neighbor's house and rang the doorbell and said, hey, is Joey here? Can he come out and play? I did that all the time. That's how I grew up. I don't have kids, but my sister now describes this really weird thing called a play date. <laughs> and it turns out what you need to do is first assess who has the most Clorox wiped home out of all of your friends. <laughs> and after you find the most disease and germ-free home, then everybody decides to gather at a certain time and bring all the children together with pre-selected toys and games already in the room designed 
of course, from the learning store or whatever it is that will activate their brains 100%. And there's always one adult who kind of monitors the kids while all the other adults drink their mommy juice and have a great time. And what happens if the kids start to argue or get into any kind of scuffle or something? That one parent runs right in and says, okay. Let's figure it out. And they solve every problem going on in that room. And you know what kids don't know how to do anymore? Solve problems. You know why? We don't let them. We don't let them. Because we don't want them to be uncomfortable. Okay. If you think doing all of this stuff for your children helps them, it doesn't. Because guess what? You were raised without all this stuff, and you all seem to have turned out pretty well. And then parents come in and say to me, why aren't my kids like what I was? And I say to them, because you don't let them do any of the things that you did. That's why. And a lot of this is based not just in your kids' anxiety that they may have, but your own anxiety about having kids and will they turn out to be awesome kids? Will they go to the best college? You, oh, I hate that phrase, let me tell you. You know what? I can't stand it. I got a buddy, um, Bob Murray is the guy who recruited, I went to Illinois Wesleyan and, and Bob Murray was the recruiter. So when I was at high school, I went to Notre Dame High School out in Niles and Bob was there and I met with Bob and we had a great talk and everything and I applied and you know, I got in. And, and when I got there and I kind of looked at what the averages were, I went to Bob and said, I don't seem to fit in here, Bob. I'm not at all these averages. I'm, I'm kind of not as good of all the students as all these other people. And Bob said, we don't just bring people here because of grades. We bring people here because of personality and because of what they can contribute and all of that kind of stuff. Now, Bob and I to this day have been friends. And Bob says, the worst thing that's ever happened to college, U.S. News and World Report. Once colleges start getting ranked as the best colleges, nobody cared about the college anymore. They cared about the best college. So nobody wants to go where it might be the best for your child. You want to go because it has a name that is ranked in a magazine. And that's where you want to go. And you know what I get? I get parents of kids who are in grade school say to me, well, but if they miss a day and they miss a test, then how are they going to get to Harvard? And they're in seventh grade. And they're already putting this kind of pressure on their family. They'll never graduate from Harvard Medical School if they keep missing a class. Okay. So today's talk deals not just with kids' anxiety, but family anxiety because everybody in the family unit contributes to all of the anxiety that is experienced within the family. And if we didn't talk about everybody and we just focused on the kid, we would be really remiss because we wouldn't be looking at the environment that's created by the family that that kid lives in. Okay? So we gotta look at all of it. Mm -hmm. So this talk is as much for all of you as it is anything about your kids as well. So we know that anxiety disorders are very real, okay? They, they exist. They're out there. This is not something made up, and this is not something that you can look at somebody and say, stop thinking about it. Get it out of your mind. Knock it off, okay? So many people believe that, though, that that's the case. So uh, I'm going to try something here. So what's your name? Neil. Neil. All right, Neil, I'm going to whip this at your face, Neil, okay? Now... <laughs> Now, Neil, do not blink, do not flinch, do not move. I promise you, Neil, that this will not hit you. I am verse in the boomerang. I have been to Australia many times. I, I know it well. I promise that right before it looks like it's going to hit you in the head, it's just going to curve back up and it's going to come fly back to me. And I'll, It's like Thor's hammer. It's like really cool, but it's not quite Thor. But, you know, it's close enough. So, so when I throw this at you, though, you can't move. Because if you move, it will throw off all of the measurements that I've already taken of the wind and everything like that, which I'm very versed. So I promise you, though, that I won't hit you. So do you think when I throw this at you, Neil, that you will flinch? Of course you will. 
So then, why do we think saying to our kids when they're anxious, stop thinking about it and don't worry about it will work? Because it won't. The, the way our brains are set up is such that once that anxiety is kicked in and that fight, flight, or freeze response is really going, rational thought is out the window. Okay? It, it just doesn't work anymore. And this is why we can't talk to people when they're anxious. You want to waste some time? Talk to somebody who's anxious. <laughs> and see how that conversation goes. How many of you have had the exact same conversation with your children at least 40 times? <laughs> Thank you. Because you're talking to them in the midst of them being anxious, and then what do you do? You go to your spouse or partner and you say, I don't get it. I don't get why they don't listen to me. I don't get why they're not hearing it. I keep saying the same thing over and over. They're just not getting it. Well, of course they're not getting it. They're anxious. They're not listening to you. They can't hear you. Because once that anxiety brain is kicked in, that fight, flight, or freeze response is on, it shuts off our logical brain. If you walk out in the middle of a street and a car's coming at you, you don't want to say, ooh, there appears to be a car coming at me. It's yellow. I love, oh, and it's a Lamb I love yellow Lamborghinis. They're, because at that point, pff, you've been run over by the car. What you want to do is go, oh, crap, car, and jump out of the way. And then you could say, but it was a yellow Lamborghini. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> We react emotionally before we react logically. Okay? I'll say that again. We react emotionally before we react logically. But how many times do we try to approach an anxiety or an emotional issue with logic and think that that's going to be helpful? If someone's in my office having a panic attack, I don't talk to them. What I say is, I'm going to sit you here with you while you have the panic attack, and after it's done, then we'll talk about it. Because I know it's useless to say to them, don't worry, you'll be fine, everything will take deep breath. That, that it, nothing's going to get through. It's not going to work. Okay. These are found in all groups of people. But the best thing about anxiety disorders is they are treatable. And today I want to get across to all of you some basic things that by tonight you can start doing with your family to start making some changes in the stress level of your home. There's a lot of talks people go to that spend a, about 90% of it on the theory and then the last two or three minutes on, now give this a try and see how it goes. Those are bad talks, all right? Those talks are horrible. No one should ever give a talk like that. We're going to spend time today on what are some practical applications of things that you can start doing when you leave this building, all right? That's our goal. So, huge impacts of anxiety disorders on family. If your kid is anxious about going to school and doesn't go, one of you stays home, you've now lost a day at work. Okay? That has an impact on the family and potentially on the functioning of the family and, and all of these different things. Or your kid won't get up and get on the bus, so now you've got to drive the kid, to, so now there's more gas. You know, just all of these different things. Anxiety disorders have huge impacts on cost for overall gross domestic product, taking a look at the influences of what decreases it, anxiety disorders account for about a third from the mental health perspective. Okay. So big influences there. What is anxiety? It is a very normal, natural experience. We all have it. And again, it's a good thing that we have it. But sometimes it gets in the way. You can think of anxiety as two words. And you know what those two words are? What if? What if, followed by the worst case scenario you can think of. No one's ever come to our office and said, what if everyone likes me and thinks I'm great? We've not treated anyone for that. All right? That's not what they show up for. 
but we sure do get a lot of, what if people judge or evaluate me and don't like me? What if somebody thinks something negative about me? What if I make a mistake? What if I goof up? What if I touch that it has a germ on it? What if, what if, what if? Anxiety is the anticipation of something negative going to happen at some point in time in the future. Anxious people don't live in the moment. Anxious people live in the past and worry about how it will come back to haunt them in the future, or anxious people live in the future and worry about all of the things they haven't thought of yet and how one of those things might be bad for them. But they don't live in the here and now. I'll give you an example of what anxiety is. I worked at a college counseling center for a few years. A woman came in, it was her second semester senior year, and she sat down and she said, I've got two weeks till graduation, I have a major that I hate that I'm graduating with, and I have a job waiting for me that I have no interest in whatsoever. I said, that sounds horrible, what's going on? She said, when I got here my freshman year, I had a major that I was really interested in. I was looking through the course book just to see what courses I would take over the four years in that major. And I saw that in one of the classes, second semester senior year, which happened to be when she came in to see me, I was going to have to take a class that required me to give a five minute speech. I got so freaked out by that that I started flipping through the course book until I found a major that required no classes with speeches. I signed up for it. I've now wasted four years and $120,000 in tuition to pay for a major that had no speeches. I said, you went to high school, right? She said, yes. I said, well, in high school, you have to take a speech class, right? She said, I did. How'd you get through it? She said, well, the teachers just let me write the speech, or they let me give it after class just to them, or they let me do a video recording of it at home. I never actually did a speech. And I said, well, then every one of those teachers failed you. Now there's an example of being uncomfortable. If you're the kind of parent who wants to call the teacher and say, you know, my kid's really uncomfortable doing speeches, could you let them do it uh, after class? That's the kind of result then that you get. All right? That doesn't work. That is failure. You know what's starting to happen at colleges now? I know this because I, I teach part-time at one a little bit. Parents are now calling professors and saying, why did you give my son a C? <laughs> I know that they're a very good student. And I think that you, you uh, have done them an injustice. To which point I go, your child's over 18, ask them why they got a C. <laughs> okay. But you know what's going to be next? Uh, yes, hi, uh, I'm here with Jimmy for his job interview. I'd just like to tell you all of Jimmy's qualities. Uh, Jimmy's a wonderful, Jimmy just doesn't like to talk very much, but I will speak for Jimmy and tell you how really wonderful Jimmy is. Does it? <laughs> I love it. So parents are calling HR about performance evaluations the bosses are giving. Fantastic, I love it, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I keep joking about it, but now you have confirmed my, my worst fear has actually come true. This is actually happening. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it just says that I'll have a job for the rest of my life, though. That's the good thing. So. Okay. So you, you laugh, but isn't it sad? I mean, think about it. This is really horrible. This is really sad that, that we think our children, even when they're in their 30s, can't handle themselves, and we need to intervene for them at their job and call their boss and say, oh, don't give them a bad performance eval, please. <laughs> right. That's unfortunate. Anxiety can help us to prepare for the future. Now, what we can see here is this, is that if you take a look at arousal level from low to high and performance level from low to high, what you actually find is that people perform best when they have some level of arousal. People with no arousal level or high arousal level actually do bad. But people who are in the middle perform the best. This is called the Yerkes-Dobson Law. In 1908, Yerkes and Dobson were two researchers who first started to take a look at this. And it's been held ever since. In fact, the top part we now call in the zone. 
that's where you want to be. So when people are in the zone, they have that right mix of anxiety and talent all going on at one time. But you know what a lot of people have these days? Something we call high anxiety sensitivity. And they have a false belief. And the false belief is, if I go do something, I should not feel anxious about it at all. I should have zero symptoms of anxiety at all in order to do best. And that's absolutely incorrect. There is nothing wrong with feeling some butterflies in your stomach and the hands a little sweaty and you're breathing up a little bit. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But when you think there's something wrong with that, you use that then to avoid doing anything and your life gets smaller and smaller. Why? Because you start to believe, I can't do anything because I keep having anxiety symptoms and as long as I have anxiety symptoms, I can't do anything. It's a circular argument. So it just doesn't work. There's nothing wrong with experiencing some symptoms of stress and anxiety. Panic, on the other hand, is immediate anxiety. It's happening right now, okay? So for that woman, anxiety was, in four years, I have to give a speech. Panic is, I've just been asked to give a speech, all right? That's the differentiation of the two of these things. Again, you want to have panic responses in certain situations. They work well for you. Our species has survived because we naturally have an anxiety system within us. You know, the caveman who said, ooh, pretty tiger, was lunch. And the caveman who said, I'm out of here, survived and propagated their genes on to the next generation. So we've, we've passed anxiety down by generation. It works for us. It's helped us to survive. We're born with anxiety instincts. Take a little baby holding them and drop them a little bit. What will you see? You'll see this. Why? That's an evolutionary instinct, just to start grabbing onto whatever that you can if you think that you're starting to fall. You don't have to teach a kid to do that. It's just built in. <laughs> All right? So there are good things in there that are built into us. But for about 25% of the population at some point in time, it gets overly sensitized. And we start looking at things being more anxiety provoking than almost anybody else would, and that starts to interfere with our lives. And that's when we go into an anxiety disorder. Okay. So, we've got this fight, flight, or freeze response built within us. Now, if I threw that hammer at you, we would have seen the fight, flight, or freeze response, because you would have done four things. Your hands would have gone up, your head would have gone down, your eyes would have closed, and you would have taken a deep breath. So we would have seen, we would have seen that automatic. You wouldn't have even thought about it. That's just automatically what you would have done. Why? Because we have a whole system built within us to automatically take over in a situation where we might be in danger. And that is a darn good thing. And this is really good in short bursts. The problem becomes is that people who have an anxiety disorder, it's, it's not short bursts anymore. It's frequent. It's often. And there's a lot of adrenaline going on all the time. Okay? And more and more things are triggering to us and more and more benign types of issues become triggers that we think are actually dangerous. And we start looking at other people go, how is it that they do that? I don't get it. How do you go to school? It's such a scary place. Okay, That kind of thing is what's happening. Now, we're all very good at saying something makes me anxious. That's a, that's a lie, just so you know. Nothing makes you anxious other than you. Because if something made you anxious, it would make every other human being anxious as well, too. Okay? So it's very easy to say, school makes me anxious. But school doesn't make you anxious. Otherwise, every student would also feel that way. You know what makes you anxious? You. You make yourself anxious about school. You make yourself anxious about crowds. You make yourself anxious about germs, whatever it is. I say this because as a therapist, if you're afraid of an elevator, I don't lock the elevator to the wall so that you're not afraid of it anymore. I help you change how you think about the elevator. I'm not in the business of changing things you're afraid of. I'm in the business of changing you so that you can deal with the things you're afraid of in a different way. But how many of us want to say, oh, my kid can't do that because that makes them anxious? That's wrong. 
That's absolutely wrong. So, we perceive fear, but at some point, everyday occurrences start to feel overwhelming to us. And we react to them as if they're dangerous. And you know what's interesting about anxiety disorders? They're often things that we've done hundreds of times already. But one day, something different happened, and now we look at it a different way. If you're in a really bad car accident, even if you've driven for 40 years, the next day, someone hands you your keys, you're like, yeah, I'm not driving. Why not? Car driving's dangerous. You've had 40 years of driving without a problem. You've had one time that something bad happened. And what's happened? You've shifted your entire philosophy about driving. And this is an interesting thing about mammalian brains. It takes one time for us to learn to be afraid of something. And it takes multiple times for us to learn to be safe. And even if we had all sorts of safety up until that one point where something happened, all that safe stuff is erased from our memory pretty much. It's there, but we don't focus on it. And all we focus on is that one bad time. And that becomes our new world. That becomes the new way that we look at everything, is that time that thing happened. In fact, anxious people are, are really good at, at looking for patterns. I had a guy come in my office one time and he said, I'm sorry I'm late. And I said, that's eh, fine. He said, well, I had a flat tire. I said, yeah, well, that stinks. He said, I know, it happens all the time. And I said, really? <laughs> what, when was your last flat tire? He said, 12 years ago. It always happens to me. <laughs> what does this prove? A very interesting point. All he's focusing on are the two times in his life that he's had a flat tire. The 11 years and 364 days without a flat tire, purely luck. All lucky days. The two days I've had a flat tire, that's my life, I'm flat tire guy, <laughs> all right? And that's how he's viewing everything. If something happens once, we watch out for it. If something happens twice, it's a pattern. And it doesn't matter how far apart those two times are. Now we've established a pattern, this is how my life goes. I am flat tire guy, <laughs> all right? If this happens to your kids, if, if one day they walk in the cafeteria and a bunch of kids are laughing, it's because somebody at that, kid, at that table told a joke, but we can also do this. Well, they're obviously laughing at me. And then a month or two later, they walk somewhere else and they hear a couple other kids laughing, say, see, everywhere I go, there's people laughing. They're all laughing at me. This is, I hate this school. Everybody laughs at me. I don't want to go here anymore. All they do is laugh at me. When we're sensitized to something and we're on the lookout for it, we will find it because it's there. And it's what we attribute it to. Are we going to go investigate and see, did someone over here tell a joke? No, because you know what's real easy? They must be laughing at me. That's just so easy to do. And then it's real easy to believe. And once we believe it, it's true. I say something hundreds of times a day to our patients at the clinic. Just because you think something or just because you believe something doesn't mean it's true. Thoughts don't make things happen. But you know what people are afraid of a lot? Their thoughts. People think thoughts have power. People think thoughts make things happen. Oprah was great at this with the secret and all that stuff. <laughs> all right? Well, that whole thing was just put positive thoughts out there and then everything good will happen and nothing bad will happen because you're always thinking positively. You think that's true? I mean, believe me, there's nothing wrong with thinking positive about something. But if you're falling off of a cliff, will a positive thought make you float? <sighs> no. Okay. Positive thoughts don't make something happen or not happen. And guess what? Negative thoughts don't necessarily make things happen or not happen. What they do, though, negative thoughts, is contribute to your overall anxiety. And if that anxiety gets higher and higher, what does that do? Interfere with your performance. And then what happens? It confirms to you that there's something wrong. Why? Because you can't perform well. But why can't you perform well? Because all you're doing is focusing on your anxiety all the time. 
keeps feeding back all, all over the place. So the yes? The positive thoughts can help. The, the, the part, though, that is dangerous is that sometimes then people will say, every time I have a negative thought, I have to replace it with a positive thought. And over time, that can become a ritual, something now that I have to do, because if I don't do it, then something bad will happen. So there, there can be a slippery slope with something like that. So what I just want people to realize is this, is that thoughts are just thoughts, and that's all that they are. I don't label a thought as good, and I don't label a thought as bad to anybody who comes in our clinic. We just talk about, are your thoughts helping you, or are they getting in the way? And that's how we like to take a look at it. So. Mm -hmm. so an approach for this, and, and just so you're all aware of, if you're going to see a therapist and, and maybe work on some of this, my recommendation, and, and this is from what we do at our clinic, is something based in what we call cognitive behavioral therapy which is going to take a look at three things. The way you think, the way you feel, and the way you behave. And it's going to really take a look at the interaction between those three things. After that, I personally believe there's kind of a slippery slope in therapy. Um, if, if I had 12 therapists up here, and I had one of you tell us your life story, I'd have 12 different therapist with 12 different reasons saying why you are the way you are. Now, which one's right? Okay. And this, to me, is kind of where, where we kind of get in trouble. And I say this because I can't tell you the number of families who come to us who say, we've done lots of therapy already, and we've done a lot of talking, and we've talked a lot about the past and dreams, and, and we've played in the sand, and we've, we've done all these different things, and they're still anxious. And, and so I'll ask the families, has anyone ever suggested to you to actually go and do the things you're afraid of? And they look at me like, what? <laughs> Why would we do that? Okay. So one mission I have is to let the populace know that there are some really good and effective treatments out there for anxiety disorders. And what I encourage any of you to do, if you're ever going to seek somebody to help all of you out in your family with anything like this, never be afraid to interview a therapist and to say, tell me about the kind of treatment that you do. And tell me about what it is you're going to do and how it's going to help our family. If a therapist looks at you and says, oh, no, I, you know, that's a little interesting, then run away. Run away. Because anybody who does what I do, cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure therapy, will tell you exactly what we're going to do right, at, right up front. Here's the treatment plan. There's no secrets here. We're not looking for some underlying issues going on or anything like that. We are purely going to look at the environment you find yourself in. And we're going to take a look at what are the things that influence certain behaviors and how can we help to make some changes in those. Good. I'll get your thoughts and feelings to change but I'm going to do it by changing your behavior. I'm not going to change your thoughts and feelings by trying to change your thoughts and feelings. Now that sounds weird, I get it, but think about this for a minute. How many of you are White Sox fans? <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, the rest of you like a minor league team, I, I assume. Um, now, Cubs fans. Will we as White Sox fans be able to convince you to not like the Cubs anymore and to like the White Sox instead? No? Sox fans, will they convince us to like the Cubs? No. That's kind of what therapy's like when you just do talking. <laughs> okay? It's very difficult to change the way people think. For the next six months, we're going to hear ads on television. They're all going to be this way. My opponent is an idiot. Do not vote for them, vote for me. <laughs> and then the next commercial will be, I'm not an idiot, but my opponent is a moron. Don't vote for them, vote for me. Now, have any of you ever heard one of these ads and afterwards said, ooh, I'm changing my vote? No. They spend six and a half billion dollars on the last election on those ads. 
If six and a half billion dollars didn't convince you to change your mind, an hour with me is not going to do much either. Okay. Now, I've never once talked anybody out of being anxious. It's never happened. I can behave people out of being anxious. So let's go back to our example we did earlier. I am not going to convince you, no matter how many hours I tell you that I won't hit you. I am not going to convince you to not flinch. You're going to flinch. But what I can do is eventually get you to not flinch. And I'm going to do that by first showing you video of me throwing this at other people and not hitting them. And then I'll bring in a live model and I will throw it at her and I won't hit her. And then eventually I'll bring you up and I'll have you stand next to her and I'll throw it at both of you and not hit either of you. And then eventually I'll move her away and I'll just throw it at you. And after about two or three hundred throws at you and not hitting you, you'll stop flinching because you'll have learned, okay, he doesn't hit people when he throws things at you. I was never going to talk you out of being anxious, but I can certainly behave you out of being anxious. I can prove to you that the thing that you're doing, even though you think it's going to be bad, isn't necessarily going to be bad. All right? And that's the kind of work that you really need to do with anxiety disorders. You waste lots of time talking. <laughs> hours and hours and hours are spent wasted talking to people who are anxious. So it's more about doing something than it is about talking about doing something. I lived in Mississippi for a while. We had a phrase down there. It was called, fixin' to get ready to do something. <laughs> All right? <laughs> I'm not getting ready to do it. I'm fixin' to get ready to do it. <laughs> and after I've fixed to get ready to do it, then I'll get ready to do it, and then I'll do it. <laughs> All right? And that's what happens a lot in families. There's a lot of fixing to get ready to do stuff, but there's not a lot of doing stuff. Okay? So we got to shift it to that behavioral piece, that behavioral change. And we have to take a look at what kind of adaptive coping skills are out there and what kind of maladaptive coping skills are people using. If you want to guarantee being anxious for the rest of your life, there are three things to do. What do you think they might be? Hmm? Avoid, number one, avoid everything you're afraid of. Yes, absolutely. If you've been in an accident in a certain intersection, don't ever drive through that intersection ever again. If you touch something and then got a cold, never touch that thing again. All right? If you gave a speech and you were sweating and shaking a little bit and somebody laughed, don't ever give a speech ever again. Avoid everything that bothers you. If you've ever had a panic attack at a mire, don't ever go back to a mire ever again. But now you just go to Kmart, but then you have one there, so now you just go to Jewel, but then you have one there, so now you just go to 7-Eleven, but then you have one there, so now you do Peapod, and that's all you do. Because your life just shrinks. The more you avoid things, the more things you find to avoid. So that's number one. What else? What are other things that maintain anxiety all the time? One we want from other people. When we're anxious, what do we want from other people? Reassurance. Reassurance. Yes, we want to be told that everything will be fine and everything will be okay. So we seek a lot of reassurance from everyone we know. We want them to tell us. We're basically saying to them, I'd like you to use your powers to see into the future and to tell me how everything will go and to promise me that all will be well. And once you've promised me all will be well, then I will do it. And therefore, if it goes well, it's great. But if it doesn't, you've given me an out because you've lied to me. And I can therefore blame you if anything goes wrong because you lied and told me all would be great. So if you want to guarantee your kids staying anxious, tell them all the time that everything will be fine. I would encourage all of you after today to never again use the phrases, you'll be fine and everything will be okay. I would encourage all of you after today to say to anybody in your family who's anxious, you can handle it. You may not like it. It may not be comfortable. You can handle it.
Number three. What's the last thing that we do when we're anxious in order to not have to deal with anything anxiety provoking? Sleep, yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my preferred, but. Uh. Hmm? We had that already, yeah. But what's an immediate avoidance? It's on that, li on that line. If you can't get out of a situation that's bothering you, what can you do so that you don't have to pay attention to it? Distract, yes. Distraction. Phones, wonderful distractions. Now, anytime we're doing something, something bothers us. Boop, 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 So pretty. Okay. So, if you want to stay anxious for the rest of your life, avoid everything you're afraid of. Ask everyone you know for reassurance that you'll be okay at all times. And if you ever do have to face something you're afraid of, distract yourself as much as you possibly can. Let's say you get a call tonight, uh, you've got to go to DC and you're afraid of flying. So what do you do? You start popping a Xanax right now. <laughs> you get to the airport, you order a couple of shots. You get on the plane, you introduce yourself to the people next to you and hold their hands and say, we'll be holding hands for the rest of this flight. Thank you very much. <laughs> you're Jewish, but you say a rosary. Why not? It can't hurt. Just cover all your bases just in case, right? Okay. You put a book in front of you so that you don't see the flames shooting about the plane as you're flying. You put a, your, your phones on so you don't hear, Mayday, we're going down. You don't want to hear that, so you just blah, blah, blah. You have that on. And when you land, you say, whew, man, it's a good thing I did all that stuff or else I never would have survived the flight. So we rely on all of these things to get us through our lives and say, doing all of these things is what has gotten me through our, my life. And therefore, I must continue to do all these things or else I can't get through my life because this is the only way to get through my life is to do all these things. And we wonder why we stay anxious forever. And the reason is simple, because we never do anything that we're afraid of and therefore we never learn how to handle those things. Now, this brain over here, the normal control, as it says, is shown a picture of something that this person over here who has OCD is afraid of. You will see the OCD brain lit up there. That's the fight, flight, or freeze response. That's what it looks like inside the brain. I bring this up because there's a lot of people who come in and say, oh, you know, my, my kid or myself, I have a chemical imbalance. And you know, the only thing that can balance chemicals is other chemicals. So therefore, to balance the chemicals that are unbalanced, I must introduce a chemical to balance that chemical. But when I introduce that chemical, sometimes it unbalances another chemical. So I must introduce another chemical to balance the chemical that became unbalanced by the chemical that was supposed to balance everything that was already unbalanced in the first place. All right. And now what are we seeing on television? My favorite commercials. Does your 16-year-old son have ginormous breasts? <laughs> <laughs> Call Harvey and Weinstein and we will sue the makers of Abilify for you for your son's big boobs. <laughs> okay. All these meds were tested on white males between the ages of about 22 to 27. That's, that's about it. Now, medication has a place, okay? I am not here to say don't use it. But what I'm here to say is, why not try something first that has no side effects whatsoever before you try something that does? Okay? Because, now, over here you see the brain that the OCD person, it's a different view, but you see where the arrow's pointing? Same spot, all that red, that's that fight, flight, or freeze response. After four weeks of having that person just practice doing the things that they were afraid of, there's no more red. There's no more fight, flight, or freeze response, which means there's no more anxiety. Guess what? Learning changes the way your brain functions. 
you can change your brain structure and chemicals just by doing the things you're afraid of without introducing any kind of chemical into your body whatsoever. Unfortunately, the drug companies have billions of dollars to tell you you need them, and us therapists, whatever changes in our pocket is what we can throw into the kitty. So we just don't have the big lobbying and all that kind of stuff available. But I like to go out and let everybody know you can change the way your brain functions by changing what you do, by doing the opposite of what you've been doing. Your learning changes the way your brain works. And there's no side effects. Yes? All ages. All ages. Absolutely. Yes? When are antidepressants or anti-anxiety drugs useful? If you're not getting the benefit out of doing this that you would like to see, then you can augment with that. I'd say that, yeah, how do you know how long before you're doing this? A good behavioral-based therapist, and, and again, I'm talking today with an anxiety disorders, okay? A good behavioral-based therapist who's doing exposure therapy, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, you ought to see about 15 sessions that that's all you would need. So I'd say about 15 weeks of therapy. It's quick. It works really fast. Yes? Anybody who has something that maybe shifts day by day is usually anxious really about their own physical sensations that they experience when they're anxious and they just find anything that may trigger them. So we expose them to those things. If you have panic or like stuff that's based in panic, which a lot of people with anxiety who will report day to day different shifters of I'm anxious about this or that because they think about something and then they start to feel some kind of physical sensation or something like that. So what we do is we expose them to the physical sensations. So if you come see me, we're gonna run in place, hyperventilate, breathe through straws, spin in chairs. We're gonna do all the things to create one symptom at a time that you experience when you get anxious so that I can teach you that none of those things that you're afraid of physically, internally happening in you are actually dangerous whatsoever. And therefore, if anything triggers them, you'll be able to say, Oh, well, I, I've dealt with that before. That's not going to harm me. But right now what's happening is you start thinking about something and then your heart rate starts going up and then your breathing increases and then the adrenaline starts going and then all this stuff starts happening. You think, wow, that must really be dangerous because just thinking about it caused this to happen. Well, what if I can teach you that there's nothing to be afraid of of all the physical sensations that you experience so that you'll learn that even if you start to have them, they're not dangerous. They're called, in, it's called uh, interoceptive exposure is the big psychological term for it. But basically, it's exposing you to your internal sensations of anxiety and panic that, that you have. Because a lot of times people will show up and they'll say, I don't know why I'm anxious or what I'm anxious about, but I have these anxiety feelings all the time. Well, that's panic. That's exactly what that is. That's a panic attack. And that's panic disorder, potentially. And honestly, amazingly treatable. Again, without needing any kind of medication whatsoever. Yes? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. An event that hasn't occurred? Like a what if event? Sure. Then, then uh, if, you like, if you're in our day program, we'll create that event for you. So if you're afraid, what if I give a speech and people boo me? Well, that's what we'll have you do. We'll have you give a speech and I'll get all the other patients in a room and they're going to start to boo you. And Fear of death, all right, so then we'll talk about what is it about death that bothers you? What are you afraid is going to happen afterwards? And, and we'll break it all down, and we'll take a look at that. And, you know, we've brought clergy in, if that's the issue, if there's a religious aspect to it or something like that, we'll take a look at all of those things. But we talk about it, and we actually address it. We, we don't talk around the issues. We, we talk about it as much as we can, and, and as much as we can, we'll do the thing that you're afraid of. I obviously can't kill you to teach you that not to be anxious about it, so that would be a bit unethical. But what I can do is, like, 
I got a friend who's uh, just down the road from Alexia and a, a buddy who runs a funeral home. I've taken patients over there to talk to him about what's it like to be a funeral director and how, what do you think about death and all those things. And it's been great and it's been very helpful to people. So we just f face it head on as much as we possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll give tests and we'll give bad grades, which is probably what she's really afraid of because she may think that the quizzes don't count as much as the final does, so there's so much more pressure on the final. So we mock role play classrooms, we, we do tests, we have people get bad grades, we practice giving them feedback of, wow, we're really disappointed that you did so badly on this, and we teach them that all these things that are in their head that they're running through, we, we just do and practice so that it doesn't bother them so much. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, we think a lot of this stuff is really helpful. It's it I think it's all a huge detriment actually. And, it's, and we ought to just go back to ignorance that all of us had, because it turned out it worked really well. <laughs> you know, I mean, we were all great just being dumb about stuff and not knowing things, and you know, it was great. Uh, we're creating more anxiety by all of this stuff. What I would do with your daughter then is talk about the idea that it's all of this checking, that's what's making her feel worse. So I would say a rule of your household is, you're not allowed to look on, the, on this website anymore to see what your test scores are. You, we're not going to look anymore on websites about colleges. If you have to shut down the internet or something, you shut it down. But if we know that those are the things that are creating anxiety for her, first we got to pull her away from that kind of stuff. Then, working with maybe a therapist, you can work on slowly introducing some of it back, but having her look at it in a different way. But we know that all of that checking is just going to create more anxiety for her, which is just going to make her performance even worse. So we've got to get that out of there first. Now, again, from an avoidance point of view, we don't want to always take it away from her. You know, we want to teach her how to handle it, but in a way that's better. But what we first might need to do is take it all away from her so that we can slowly reintroduce it to her in a better way. Yeah. I was just going to ask you if Johnny was avoided. Yeah, right. So. Um, that's, that's why we would do it that way. I mean, uh, it, it's hard when somebody's doing something that's really bad for them to slowly take them away from it. Sometimes we have to remove it, and then it's easier to slowly reintroduce it than it is to try to slowly wean them off of something. Um, well, then the role play piece becomes important by if I can even getting some of their friends or family involved in some of the uh, exposures that we do as well, too, to make it even more realistic to real life settings. Uh, that's try to, what I always try to do is make it as, as close as possible to a real life setting so that it'll just be one step. I think of a <clears throat> one of the first behavioral videos that I ever watched that's just kind of really just cemented for me the, the value of behavioral therapy was a girl who wouldn't walk unless she was holding hands with someone. Now she had every ability to walk, but she wouldn't walk unless she was holding someone's hand. <coughs> so therapist came in and was holding her hand for a while and then let one finger go and just held her hand here and then two fingers and then three and then was just holding her hand by her pinky. And that's where they stopped that day. The next day, he introduced a rope, and he held the rope 
in his hand and had her hand right next to holding the rope. And then he started inching out on the rope. And then he dropped the rope. And now she was walking <clears throat> as long as she had the rope. Take the rope out of her hand, she fell. The next day, they give her the rope, she's walking, and now they start cutting the rope. <laughs> okay. Finally, the rope is down to a thread, and eventually she dropped the thread and just continued walking. So slow, gradual approximations to ultimately what you want to do. So if I have to pull family members or friends in or something like that, I'll do those very things. Uh, there's a therapist out uh, not far from this area. His name's Todd Henneke. He's a friend of mine. We went to grad school together. He's a school psychologist. And Todd runs a group for kids who are on the spectrum. <coughs> so autism, Asperger. And he calls it the private investigator group. And what Todd does is he takes the kids on the spectrum and they sit in a room and they close the blinds, except for one they lift up. And if you looked real close, you'd see 10 pairs of eyes looking up. <laughs> And the room faces where recess is with all the other kids. And what Todd does is he has them all take notes about what kids were doing out on the playground and what was good and what wasn't good. And after a week of that, inside the room then, they practice recess with each other, practicing doing the things that they felt were good with all of the other kids. After doing that for a week, every day they send one of those kids out into recess while the other nine sit there. <laughs> And those nine take notes about how that one kid did. And when that kid comes back, they say, well, we'd like to give you your feedback now, and uh, here's what you did well, and here's what you did. And they do it that way. And it's been awesome. They have really worked, without Todd doing much of anything, it has been the peers who have really influenced this kid to go out and do stuff and really practice it. So here are people who, you know, in real life, often do fail and not do really well, but by peer interaction and peer role playing, have then been able to take it outside and actually see improvement and do well. So, hopefully that. Yes? <laughs> Great. Okay, so the question was, if you didn't hear it, her 10-year-old son two years ago wore a belt. He uh, went to go to the bathroom, couldn't undo the belt. I assume peed in his pants, unfortunately, or, or was close at least or something like that. But it was, now he never wants that feeling again. Um, are his pants falling down, number one, all the time? Or do you? No. He, no. He, he, only wear pants he, he likes the tight pant look. Okay, very good. Uh, <laughs> but you would like him to wear a belt, and eventually he'll have to wear a belt. It looks good and everything for things. So what I would start to do is something called the Premack Principle. <laughs> Premack was an old psychologist who talked about basically what Pink Floyd once said, how can you have your pudding if you don't eat your meat? And it's the same kind of principle of you like to um, play video games on Saturday night? Great. You can only do that if during, on Saturday all day you wore a belt. If you didn't wear a belt on Saturday, then you don't get any video games. And you can start first with a belt that's loose. Or you might even start with a belt that doesn't even have like the buckle in it, but just one of the strap ones, so that all he has to do is pull the strap out. And you can slowly then gradually work on, and you can also role play and practice with him. All right, put the belt on, take it off, put it on, take it off. And you can do half an hour of practice a day of putting on a belt and taking it off so that he learns, I can handle a belt. Okay? So that could be helpful. I'm up front. Yes, I am up front. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've kind of figured out a way to do it without scaring people away in 15 <laughs> years of doing it. So there is a finesse to then doing it. I mean, if somebody comes in and they say, I'm so afraid to be in class. But, uh, you know, I have a way of talking to them about getting them by the time they leave going, wow, I'm really looking forward to going to class. You know, there's, a, there's this thing called motivational interviewing. It's a style of interview that we do that really pushes this motivation back onto the patient because we know that this doesn't work if they're not motivated to do it. So 
We definitely have a way of, I mean, I don't just say to somebody, oh, you're afraid of swimming? Great, let's go to the pool. This is, this is not flooding. This is a gradual buildup to the experience. So I would never just say to someone, all right, well, that's what we're going to go do. I would say to someone, well, maybe the first thing to do if you're afraid to go to school would be just to wake up at the time you would normally wake up when you go to school and put on your school clothes. How do you get them to agree to go to therapy in the first place? That's what, kind of where it's on you. And for you to say, you know, if you don't go to therapy, then we're shutting the internet off at the house and um, there'll be no, some of these other things. Your favorite snacks will disappear and everything. And, and you can earn things back. Now, I talk to families all the time about life is an economy. Moms and dads, you go to work or stay home to keep the household running. Imagine if you all said, you know what? I'm just not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do it. What would happen? The house would fall apart because there'd be no more money coming in. Nobody would clean anything. Nobody would cook. Nothing, nothing would work. Kids have a role in the economy, and they, their role is to go to school, to go to therapy if necessary, to do those types of things. If they don't participate in the economy, they don't get the rewards of the economy. Just like if you didn't participate in the economy, you wouldn't get the rewards of the economy. So what kids' roles are, are like school and therapy and that stuff, maybe some kind of extracurricular activity. And their rewards are, you get to use our internet, you get to use the cell phone, you get, you get to have play dates, you know, those kinds of things. And if you choose not to do these things, then you don't get these things. It's, it's, that's what you do. Now, they're going to not like you at first when you introduce this, okay? Because here's, and here's what I want all of you to really remember, this. When your kid's yelling at you because they're anxious, they're yelling at you from their fight, flight, or freeze response, emotional mind. They are not talking to you from their logical mind. Do not take it personally when they call you names or things like that. The reason they're doing this is because they want to get their way. They want to win. Why? Because their anxiety wants them to be in a situation that is as comfortable as it can possibly be. And they will do whatever they possibly can to put themselves into a situation that is comfortable as that situation can possibly be. And if it means really pissing you off so you'll go cry, they just want another 10 minutes of you leaving them alone, okay? So you've got to look at this as you're battling somebody's primitive fight, flight, or freeze response brain and not any kind of logical thing that's going on. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You had? I was going to say, uh, what's the best advice for parents to hear that disrespect and that avoidance and that resistance and that counseling for their own? Yeah. So what's the best advice for parents who hear that avoidance and resistance and then pounce into that anger and anxiety? Um, my best advice to parents who do that is, you've just done exactly what your kid was hoping you would do. Your kid switched it from being you wanting what you want them to do to them throwing you off your game and getting you so worked up and frustrated that you'll eventually just leave them alone because you're so angry at them. So when you get angry and your emotion goes up, your kid won. You just fed them a victory. Your job when your kid's doing that is to be as calm as possible. You want to really anger your kid, have no reaction to them whatsoever. <laughs> that will rile them up, and they will try harder and harder. Okay? And your job is to just stay there as calm as whatever and say, that's just how it's going to be, and we're not going to talk about it. Because your kid then also wants you to talk about it, because they're hoping if they get you talking, then they can find loopholes or they can try to convince you to think differently. So your job is to not talk about it and just say, this is just how it is, and that's what we're doing. Yes? But there are other members of the family. Yeah, that, and that's hard, because if not everybody's on board with this, then that, that person just finds those other people who give in to them. So switch this from anxiety to alcohol or drugs. If your kid was in the hospital going through withdrawal, 
all right? And you went to visit them. And they said to you, Mom, Dad, please just go get me some alcohol. These, this withdrawal is horrible. I'm throwing up. I've got diarrhea. I've got a fever. I'm sweating. I've never felt so bad in my entire life. Could you please just go get me some alcohol so that I can stop this withdrawal? How many of you would say, I'll be right back? <laughs> so let me ask you this question. Why is it okay to suffer physically now to get better later, but it is not okay to suffer emotionally now in order to get better later? Why is that? Why do we say to the kid who's going withdrawal, I'm so sorry, I know that this is horrible, but this is in your best interest. And we say to the kid who's anxious, oh, oh, well, what can I do for you right away? Oh, hold on, hold on, oh, wait, that's horrible. Oh, no, you should never feel that way. Oh, gosh. That doesn't work. So here's the thing. You're all used to this already because you've all had kids who have gone through stuff that are uncomfortable, right? The emergency room, they got to get stitches or those, you know. Do you say to them, when they're getting the stitches and they're crying, do you say, all right, well, we'll just won't give you stitches. We'll just let that wound heal by itself. <sighs> no. Why, do, why is it okay physically but not mentally? What's the difference? That you have to think about. Yeah. I love beating dead horses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. All right. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Right. Because their kids are falling apart. Mm -hmm. yeah, There's a middle ground to find. Your kid doesn't have to be in all AP courses, but I'm not saying that you have to be in none of them. There's a middle ground. Your kid doesn't have to be in 12 extracurricular activities, but they don't have to be in none either. There's a middle ground. Uh, I get families who come in and, and I look at the kid's schedule. The kid doesn't even have a lunch because they're in so many classes or AP and that's the only way they could schedule it. And I just, I think that's awful that A, a school would let that happen and B, that a family would let their kid go through something like that. So I have made the recommendation to families, I'm sure you have two of, we gotta pull out of one or two of these AP courses, they're too much. There's not enough time in the day. You, kids who are teenagers need eight hours of sleep a night. They're getting about four or five right now. They need eight in order to fully be able to function and be okay. So if they're not getting eight hours of sleep because they're doing six hours of homework, there's a problem. Because after three or four weeks of six hours of homework and four hours of sleep, they're going to collapse. They're going to shut down. Their brains won't function anymore. It just won't work. So there's got to be a midpoint. We've got to find that middle ground. And, and when you're working with a kid, and I think you'll probably see this too, it doesn't mean the kid's a failure that they haven't figured out how to schedule this. It means the kid's found their breaking point, and it's not a good thing to live on that edge of that breaking point all the time. Yeah. Right. Right. They are very, very scheduled, mm -hmm. but they're gone. Yeah. Yes. Sure, good sleep hygiene thing. So if you're in bed more than 10 minutes without sleeping, uh, get out of bed, go sit in a chair, but don't turn on a screen. The blue light of a screen wakes you up. They can read, turn on a regular light and they can do a soft light, they can do some reading of a book or something like that. Eventually they'll, they'll get tired enough, they'll fall asleep, but they're not doing things that are waking them up with the screens or things like that. I mean, I think a lot of families need to cut screens off by about 10 or 10.30. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. There's a lot of stuff coming out, and, and it's stuff I'm honestly just kind of learning right now because there's something new called CBTI. <laughs> it's Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. So there's a whole new study now of sleep medicine that's going on. And one of the things we've done at Alexian, we've just started a sleep rotation. We've got a guy who's gonna do a postdoc in sleep rotation with us. We've got a psychiatrist who just passed her boards in sleep medicine. So um, I'm not as familiar with that, but what I will do is I'll have Steve talk to them here and maybe we can get one of them to come and do some talks about that because it's not as much my area, but I, and I'm just learning some of that stuff now. But I do know the whole, the screens are a big important piece and don't lay in bed more than 10 minutes. Oh, and the other thing, don't do your homework in bed because you want bed to be for sleep and that's what you want it to be. You start combining homework into bed, bed becomes an anxiety provoking place if all your homework is anxiety provoking. So homework needs to be done at a desk or a dining room table or something like that and bed can only be used for sleep. That's helpful too. Yes. Absolutely. Grab the phone. Yep. Mm -hmm. You'll get your phone back in the morning. You hand your phone over at 10, you get your phone back in the morning. Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. Sure. So, yeah. A kid on the spectrum, how can you really tell if they're anxious or is it just part of the spectrum? It, it, is, a, it is a tough call because kids on the spectrum do exhibit a lot of anxiety-like behaviors, especially a lot of OCD-like behaviors because they get really involved in something and it has to be done a certain way and that kind of thing. So it can be confused a lot of times for, for um, OCD. But, you know, one thing, even with kids on the spectrum, Let's say when they're driving to school, they only want to go one way, you know. So you, you might do a game where you roll a die, and if you roll a five, that's the day that you take a different way to school, you know. So you start to slowly introduce new little things into their lives. And the thing that's nice about the die is that it wasn't you who made the choice to do it, so they're not going to get angry at you. We're relying just on chance to see how things happen because that's what's gonna happen in life too, is that chance things are gonna to happen to them in life and they're gonna to have to learn to deal with it. So. The reason I ask is because I don't really know, but you don't really have those kind of those things that mm -hmm. have to be a certain amount necessarily. But I know in school they say you need to be very active. And I don't see it at home. So that's why I'm saying, is there a disconnect in the episode of saying that, but what, what could I do? I well, home could also be very comfortable for him because it's so much more familiar and it's, he's more in control at home than he is at school where it might feel a little bit less controlled. So I would ask for more, what are the behavioral manifestations you're seeing? Don't just rely on the words when someone says to you, he seems anxious. What does that mean? What are you seeing that's showing you what anxiety is? Because then that's the stuff you can take to a therapist and talk about with a the therapist and your kid. But if it's just they're anxious, that they're, that's not enough. Yes? They could be, or they could just be feeling uncomfortable and they're putting a label on it and then they're wanting to use that label as an excuse to not do stuff. So, you know, I would say to them that many people feel uncomfortable when initially doing things, but as they learn how to do it, that discomfort goes away. So I'm glad you can acknowledge your discomfort, but it doesn't mean that that has to impair you from ever doing anything. When you started walking, you were uncomfortable. You know, you, were, you weren't bouncing really well and you fell a lot. Imagine as a child you said, well, that was uncomfortable. I'm just going to crawl the rest of my life, all right? Or if you learned how to ride a bicycle, you were uncomfortable when you were first doing it. But you eventually just kept doing it and doing it until you learned that you could handle it. So you've spent your entire life doing things that have been uncomfortable initially and then learned how to handle them. We're going to have you do the same thing here. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, a lot of kids will hold it together at school because they don't want to be seen as weird or something wrong with them. Um, here's the thing. Your friends don't have to like you, but your family does. So you, you often act really normal around your friends because they have to like you. But once you get home, all the anxiety that you experience all the day that you kind of stored in your memory breaks now comes out. And now you can act it out when you're at home because the people there have to like you because they're family. So um, I would honestly work on starting to ignore him and paying less attention to that behavior and let him sit with it by himself instead of being very motherly kind of and yeah good then eventually I think he'll just learn that he'll have his time to get out what he needs to and then he can join the family and do what he needs to do and I think over time you'll see that decrease in time all right well before we I want to get definitely do a couple of things today so um, we'll hold a few things off until we get there but just so you know that a lot of fears will come across in these ways. There will be some kind of thing that we're afraid of physically happening to us or that we may cause something bad to happen to others physically. You'll see this like with OCD. I might touch something and get a germ, but I might also leave a germ somewhere that someone else will get and that will be my fault and I don't want that either. So it could be something happening to me or me doing something to somebody else. There could be a threat to our mental status that we're going to go crazy or lose control. We think we're this close to just losing it. And one more thing happening to us will just send us over the edge. So we get a lot of fears around that. Our social status, we're afraid to be judged or evaluated in some way. What if we make a mistake? What if we goof up? Something along those lines. We don't want anything like that to happen. And finally, our spiritual status. Uh, this can be in the form of scrupulosity. Scrupulosity is obsessive compulsive disorder about morals or ethics or religion. A fear that we've done something bad or wrong to harm other people, that people will judge or evaluate us on an ethical perspective, or that we have somehow offended a higher power or something like that as well too. Um, working at a Catholic hospital, I can say this, this used to be a very Catholic problem uh, because the Catholic religion used to be very ordered and regimented and there were just, this is the way you do it. It's very OCD-ish. And after Vatican II, it switched from being a Catholic issue to a fundamental issue. Now we see people from all faiths, but who take it on a fundamental kind of way, that it's uh, very easy then to have scrupulosity and to always be thinking you've done something wrong and you're going to hell. So we treat lots of people now who come across that. And it can be even as simple as kids who don't use the number six, because six, of course, is the sign of the beast. Kids who won't use the color red, because red's the color of the devil. So um, they get all their math problems wrong because they leave a blank space where six is supposed to be and stuff like that, because they don't want to offend God by using a six. So. All right, I want to jump ahead a little bit to, um, again, the, the distortions are things like severity. It's always the worst case scenario kind of stuff that we're dealing with. The probability is 100%. You can ask somebody, well, why hasn't it happened yet? They always have the same answer. I've just been very lucky up until today, but today's the day it's probably gonna happen. <laughs> and many anxious people confuse possibility and probability. They believe them to be equal to each other. Therefore, if something is possible, it's 100% probable that today's the day it's going to happen. Right? So that's very often how people look at this kind of stuff too. And remember that efficacy piece, I won't be able to handle it. This is our model that we utilize. We have some kind of a fear stimulus that occurs. It leads to a misinterpretation of a threat. We work on the worst case scenario there. That makes us anxious. So what do we do? Avoidance or reassurance or distraction. And what happens? We get through the experience. And why do we get through it? Because we did avoidance or reassurance and distraction, that's why. So what does that do? It creates a feedback loop because we never have a corrective experience. We never learn that we can handle what we're afraid of. What do we learn? I'm okay because I did avoidance and reassurance and distraction. That's why I'm okay. And in order to stay okay, I must do more avoidance, reassurance, and distraction because only those things will keep me okay. All right? Now, the intervention piece really does come in in that avoidant piece. So like here's a separation anxiety case, you know, I'm afraid to leave my parent, I'm afraid something bad will happen to them, that makes me anxious, so I'm going to fight going to school, I'm going to play sick, and what am I going to do? When I stay home and I, I'm there all day and nothing bad happens to mom, what do I learn? Mom's okay because I stayed home. My avoidance of school worked, it kept her safe, and if I want her to continue to stay safe, you know what I need to do? Stay home more. So it's that immediate 
feeling that you get from the avoidance or reassurance and distraction, that short-term relief that comes from that is so very powerful that we spend our lives constantly seeking that short-term relief. We don't go for long-term functioning. So you have to look at it like this. Are you willing to be uncomfortable now in order to feel better later? Or are you always going to try to be comfortable now and in doing so, never learn how to feel good later? That's what happens. One or the other. All right, so I'm going to skip ahead because I want to get to uh, the don't try harder stuff. So let's start with this. The concept of don't try harder, try different goes along the lines of if we just keep trying harder at things that aren't working, they just aren't going to work that much more. Therefore, trying harder is not the thing to do. Sometimes we need to do something else. Sometimes we have to do something different instead. The first principle of don't try harder, try different is the word should. Let me ask all of you, when was the last time any of you used the word should to describe something that went well? Exactly. Should is always negative. I should have done this, I shouldn't have done that, it should have been this way, it shouldn't have been that way, they should have said this, they shouldn't have said that. I tell people to stop shooting all over the place. All right? The shoulds are always negative. But anxious people love the word should. It's a big favorite of theirs. Okay? So here's the thing with should. Should's an opinion. Now, anxious people love to use the word should, must, ought, have to, and need to. They're all or nothing words. When you live in the world of anxiety, there's no middle ground. It should be this, and everything else is what it shouldn't be. It must be this, and everything else is what it must not be. It has to be this, and everything else is what it has to not be. That's why the uh, arrow's here at the bottom. It's the only acceptable place to hit the target is right in the middle. Anywhere else is where you shouldn't have hit it. Now, if we take that into school, the only thing that's acceptable is 100%. The only thing that's acceptable is an A+. I had a kid, genius level IQ, kind of like this kids you were talking about, who for a, a whole semester has not turned in a homework assignment and is failing everything. And the reason he's failing everything, it's better to get an F for doing nothing than it is to get an A-. minus. Because an A minus means somebody didn't think I was perfect. An F means I just chose not to do it. But had I done it, it would have been an A plus. And that's how he gets around it. Now, in his head, he's still perfect. He still doesn't make mistakes. He just chooses not to do things, that's all. Okay. So when you live your life that... If it's here, it's perfect, but it shouldn't hit here, 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 or anything like that. We've got problems because we want to shift from should, must, ought, have to, and need to to things like I wish, I want, I hope for, it would be nice if, I'm working toward, my goal is, I would like. Those are things we can have discussions about. Those leave options open to us. Should has no options. There's what it should be, and there's everything else that's wrong. Okay? Now, in your homes, I want you to start paying attention to how many times a day do you all say should, must, ought, have to, and need to. And can we work on switching that to I wish, I want, I hope for, it would be nice if, we're working toward, our goal is, we would like. Because those have conversations that you can have about things. Okay? There's no conversation about should. It should be this way. Why? Because it should. There's, there's no conversation there. All right? So that we got to watch. What's your name? Jennifer? Jennifer, you should not wear those shoes anymore, Jennifer. They're horrible. I don't know why you're wearing them. And Jennifer may say, I should wear these shoes every day. They're totally awesome. Which one of us is right? Me saying she shouldn't wear them or her saying that she should? They went out. Depends on who it's coming 
right. Yeah, you want to see the shoes to get the opinion first. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Neither of us is right, should's an opinion, okay? But I've said it as a should statement, which basically means this. If you wear those shoes again, I'll be mad at you because I said you shouldn't wear them anymore. But if you don't wear those shoes again, you'll be mad at me because who am I to tell you what you should or shouldn't wear? Based on the should statement, what I've said is I'm right and you're wrong. Do what I say, we're good. Don't do what I say, we've got a problem. Don't violate my should, all right? I don't like that. As long as you do everything that I say that you should do, then we're good. And this is how anxious people look at the world. As long as everything goes the way that I think that it should, then my life is okay. But if even one thing happens that shouldn't happen, it's a horrible day. It's awful. All right. I got through the whole day and nothing bad happened, and then I got home and I stubbed my toe and it hurt for a while. That shouldn't have happened. Another crappy day. See, it always happens to me. Oh, sorry, I said you. <laughs> but that's the way that we look at it. Okay? So watch out for these all or nothing words or phrases. They get in the way. Yes? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I would do this. If you keep having a, an interaction that recurs over and over again all the time, a conversation, a question, I would get a, what I call a worry journal and I would write out that question and then I would write out your answer and any time that comes up again, you hand them the worry journal and you say, well, that's on page four. And you never talk about it again. Yeah, no, we don't talk about it again. Because talking about it again doesn't solve anything. It just repeats a conversation. Worry journals are wonderful little tools to use in your household so that you don't keep having the same conversations over and over again. Good. A, a what went well journal is fantastic also. I love it. That's great. So what's yeah. the general concept? The general concept is there's no need to repeat a conversation more than once. So if you keep getting asked the same thing over and over again, write the question down and then write down the answer. And then if they want to go into that conversation again, you just hand them the book and say, we already wrote that conversation down. Here you go. Sure. Just like what she said. There you go. So you write down in the worry journal, why do I have to do homework? Homework is stupid. And then you write down your answer. And if he says it to you, you hand him the journal and say, there you go. We already talked about that. What's next? Okay. And you don't have that conversation again. Because it turns out that conversation then delays having to do homework, which your son's hoping to do so that he doesn't have to do homework. So don't go down that road. Mm -hmm. No, it, it's, it's not that we don't care. It's, it's that if, if you want to tell me something that's going on emotionally right now that we need to go over, that's, that we can. But if you're going to have the same thing happen every single night, we, we don't need to do that. So, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't cut somebody. I mean, if somebody had an emotional thing going on, I'd definitely address it. But if it's just the same behavior over and over again, there's no need to go down that road every single night and do the same thing over and over. Number two, can't versus won't. Anxious people love the word can't. It's a big favorite of theirs. 
it is very easy to say that you can't do something. But the issue is, is that if you can't do something, then that's exactly what's going to happen. You are not going to do it. Okay? So I always use the uh, example of an elevator. If somebody comes to my office and says to me, I can't get on an elevator, I will say to them, well, let's go test that out. And we will get up and we will walk through the doorway and we will walk down the hall and we will go to the elevator. We will press the elevator button, the elevator doors will open and I will look at the patient and I will say, I'd like to watch you bounce off the invisible force field that appears in front of the elevator. And they look at me and they say, what are you talking about? And I say, well, here's the thing. Getting onto an elevator involves walking and walking through a doorway, which you've already done multiple times coming in and out of my office. So I know that you can walk and I know that you can walk through doorways. The only reason, therefore, why you can't get on an elevator must be that there's a force field blocking you. And I think it'd be funny to watch you bounce off of it. Go. <coughs> and then they say, I hate you. And then they say, um, <laughs> then they say, Fine, I can get on the elevator, but I don't want to. Why? Because I'm afraid. Great, that we can work on. That I can help you with. It is so easy to say, I can't do it. It's a lie most of the time, but it is so easy to say. Do not accept your kids telling you they can't do something because they're anxious about it. They won't do it because they're anxious about it, which means we have to give them an opportunity to slowly and gradually work their way up to doing it. All right? And that's what we do with exposure therapy. This thing that we have been kind of alluding to, this exposure and response prevention therapy. Getting people to do things they're afraid of without using avoidance, reassurance, and distraction. That's what it is. And you do it on a hierarchy. You start with low-level stuff and you work your way up. This is not jump in the pool and swim. This is put a toe in the water and see how it feels. And that's your first step. And we slowly and gradually build up to doing things people are afraid of. Okay. Somebody's afraid of doing speeches. We start with sitting down, no eye contact, reading me a paragraph from a magazine. And we go from there to making up a speech that has tons of mistakes in it purposely in front of a whole group of people who are booing you the whole time you're doing. And you know what happens every time we do that? The person doing it starts laughing and says, I can't believe I was afraid of this. This is stupid. And I was like, yeah, it is. You're right. It's <laughs> totally stupid. And you spent years of your life worrying about this thing, and now you're laughing at it. And we never make anybody do anything, ever. And we would never have anybody do anything that we wouldn't do ourselves. I have done every single exposure to anything anyone's afraid of right next to them, every single time. Because I tell the patient, if this is going to hurt you, it's going to hurt me too. And I am more than willing to put myself into this situation to show you that it can be done. Don't accept your kids telling you they can't do things that they won't do because they're anxious. It will be annoying to them, but always say to them, you mean you won't do it? You mean you won't do this? Why won't you do that? I can't. No, why won't you? Right. We overuse the word can't. If you're busy and somebody calls you on the phone, you pick up the phone after you say hello, what do you, what do you usually say? I can't talk right now, exactly, yeah. Which would actually be this. <laughs> Telling someone you can't talk just violated the phrase, I can't talk, all right? So it's not that you can't talk to them. Uh, the reality is actually this. It doesn't sound so nice, but imagine picking up the phone and saying, hey, what I'm doing is more important than you, but when you become more important what I'm doing, I'll call you back, <laughs> all right? That doesn't sound so nice, so we don't say that, but that's really what it is. But what do we say? I can't talk right now. We say can't all the time. <coughs> right? Don't let anxious people get away with telling you they can't do something that they're afraid of. Because being anxious doesn't mean you can't do it. Being anxious means you won't do it because you're afraid of it.
can't means you don't have the ability to do something. And fine, if you don't have the ability to do something, then that's okay. But from an anxiety point of view, it doesn't work. There's nothing that you can't do because of anxiety. There's only things that you won't do because of anxiety. All right? So remember that. Number three, <coughs> practice makes what? Perfect, I heard. Progress, I heard. Okay. If practice made perfect, 90-year-olds would be the best drivers in the world. You'd think by now they'd, they'd have that down pretty well, right? Better, better or progress. Uh, as alcoholics continue drinking, their lives get better or progress well, right? Or, or not. Permanent. Permanent. So once you've practiced something enough, you would never make a mistake or do anything wrong again, right? No, maybe not. Okay. Change. Habit. Ah, habit. Ooh, yeah, there we go. Practice doesn't make perfect. We know that, all right? Perfect does not exist. Perfect is like should. Perfect is an opinion. We all have a different opinion of what perfect is. There is no such thing as perfect. If there was, then uh, we would go to a restaurant and, and we would all order, and we would all, of course, order the perfect appetizer, right? In fact, the restaurant wouldn't even have any options on the menu, it would just say appetizer, and they would just bring it to you because it would be the perfect appetizer. You would never say, you know, today I'm thinking about trying your not perfect appetizer. Actually, I like to give that a go. Wouldn't happen, all right? Perfect does not exist. But how many people try to be perfect and fail miserably because they try to be perfect? So how about this? Practice makes routine. The more you practice something, the more likely you are to do it that way again in the future. The thing that I like about this is it takes any valence out of it. There's no positive or negative here. There's no right or wrong. We're just looking at what it is. Practice makes routine. Now, going back to what we talked about earlier with safety-seeking behaviors, we discussed for a little bit about what are some routines that anxious people do. They are avoidance, reassurance, and distraction those become the anxiety person's routines. And they keep practicing those things over and over and over and over. Okay. That becomes their life. And what do you see in people who have anxiety disorders about their life? What happens? It shrinks over time. It gets smaller and smaller and they refuse more and more things and they go less and less places and they talk to fewer and fewer people and they feel worse and worse and worse, and they want to sleep more and more, and their life just becomes this tiny little thing. All that's because they keep doing more avoidance, reassurance, and distraction. We have to change their routines. We have to get them to do things that they are afraid of and learn that they can handle them. And that's the thing that I really like about this concept with routines, is that routines can change. We can identify if a routine is helping or if a routine is getting in the way. If a routine is helping, we will continue to do it. If a routine is getting in the way, we will do something else. We will try something different. Not harder, but different. I learned this one. I, I, I remember the day I learned this, actually. And it actually had nothing to do with psychology. When I was 16, uh, boys volleyball did not exist as a varsity sport when I was in high school. But there were a bunch of us at several schools who really liked volleyball. And so we talked to some of the coaches, and a few coaches at a few schools, like Notre Dame and Loyola and Rolling Meadows and a few of us out there, decided we were going to form some club teams to see if maybe we could convince IHSA to make boys volleyball a varsity sport. So for two years, we did club play. And I was a pretty good server, and so Coach Ryan would put a chair on the other end of the, of the court, and my job was to hit the chair with a serve. And I got pretty good at it. And then one day he put the chair on the line. Now, if you're familiar with volleyball at all, the line is six feet behind the net. The net is 10 feet tall. A chair is three feet tall. He wants me to hit a three foot tall chair behind a 10 foot tall object and drop it within six feet down seven feet to hit a chair. And one day I did it. And I hit the thing so hard I broke the chair. And I looked at Coach Ryan and I said, see, practice makes perfect. 
And Coach Ryan said, no, it makes routine. If it made perfect, you would never miss the chair again, which I promptly did on the next serve. So, and it's one of those moments in your life where you hear something and it just kind of sticks with you and you just, you know, I never forgot that moment. And as I started working with anxious people, I started to notice, look what they're doing. They're always trying to be perfect. And they're always failing. And they keep holding on to this belief that practice makes perfect. Now, the Greeks wrote a myth about this. It's called the myth of Sisyphus. In the myth of Sisyphus, Sisyphus angers the gods and he's sent to Hades, but he's told a lie. And the lie that the gods play on him is this. If you take this stone and you roll it up to the top of this hill and you get it to the top, we will let you out of Hades and you will be a demigod. The joke played on Sisyphus by the gods is the stone was one pound too heavy and the hill one degree too steep for him to ever be able to get it up to the top of the hill. And therefore Sisyphus is condemned for all eternity to keep trying to get this thing up to the top but never quite getting there. And that's what perfectionism is like. To take it to more modern terms, anybody remember playing Atari when you were growing up? All right. What was the high score in Atari? You remember? 999,999. What happened if you got one more point? Went to zero, yeah. It's called rolling the game over. And if you did it, you were like, you called all your friends like, dude, I just rolled over asteroids. They're like, awesome! You know, that was great. <laughs> so, that was so cool, you know. Now, perfection is a million points, but you're playing Atari. And all you can get is 999,999. And then your, your perfectionism little thing in your head says, oh, just one more point. Just, you're so close. Yeah. Oh, crap. All right. Well, we'll start all over again. And we'll, you, next time. Next time you'll get there. And that's what a perfectionist life is like. Never actually achieving any goal that they set because they're trying to be perfect and that's never going to happen. The, dic the dictionary definition of perfect says all 8 billion people on the planet will look at what you did and say, wow, that was perfect. Will that ever happen? That 8 billion people will agree that something's perfect. Absolutely not. So, how about this? Why not set goals that are attainable? And after you achieve them, set another goal that's then attainable. And then after you achieve that, set another goal that's attainable. And keep doing that instead of constantly failing and only being disappointed because you've never achieved anything. Okay. And see how that works first. Number four, control is an illusion. Now this is the one people really hate the most, all right? Because boy, we really want to be in control. Now, control is often attempted through worry, and worry serves a couple of functions. But before we get to that, we talked a little bit earlier about that concept of cognitive behavioral therapy and the idea that there are three things that we can really assess. The way you think, the way you feel, and the way you behave. If we could be in control, then we would be able to control the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we behave. So let's test that out, okay? Let's try it. Let's see who has thought control. Here we go. Don't think of a pink elephant right now. Did anyone think of one? Yep, okay. So we don't have thought control. It would be nice, but we don't. Let's see who has feeling control. After today's talk, never be anxious again ever for the rest of your life. You think that'll work? Well, it's a pretty good talk. I mean, you got to admit, you know? no? All right. Let's try behavior control. Do not blink your eyes for the next 48 hours. Just keep them wide open. Now, what do we learn there? We don't have total control over the way we think. We don't have total control over the way we feel. And we don't have total control over the way we behave, which means we are not in total control of ourselves. And if we are not even in total control of ourselves, how will we be in control of anyone or anything outside of ourselves if we're not even in control of ourselves? Control is an illusion. 
We can have some, okay? I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but to be in total control of the whole situation at all times, not going to happen. Think of weddings. I, I like to think of weddings in this situation. I got married about a year and a half ago. And um, I'd say that your wedding day is probably the most planned day of your life. You spend like a year and a half planning six hours of your existence. <laughs> All right? I still haven't been to one where something didn't go wrong. We were one sentence into the wedding when somebody sat down on a bench that didn't have anyone on the other side, flipped the bench in the air, she goes sprawling off, bench crashes back down, and we were a sentence into the ceremony. <laughs> it's like, thank you all for coming, BAM! <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's kind of what happened. <laughs> Things happen. We are not in control. But what do we do? We worry. And you know what? Our culture loves worry. We love to worry about things. You know why? Because we think, if I can't do anything, at least I can worry about it. That somehow that will be helpful and make things better. Now, I remember being 16 years old and driving my mom's Delta 88 Oldsmobile around Chicago, and I'd come home, and my dad and my mom would be there, and my dad would say, is the car okay? And I'd say, yeah, Dad, it's fine. And my mom would say, are you okay? And I'd say, yeah, Mom, I'm fine. And then they would both say, see, it's a good thing we were worrying about you. <laughs> that somehow those worries prevented me from slamming into a light pole on the Kennedy when I was 16 years old. So... We hold on to this notion that worry works, that worry helps us, that worry makes us better, that worry improves our lives. Let's test it out. Does worry actually influence the world at all? I'm going to let this pen go, and I would like for all of you to worry about it not hitting the floor, all right? Your worries about it not hitting the floor will prove that if we worry hard enough, we can influence the world. Because if your worries have stopped disease and disaster and car accidents and tornadoes and lightning strikes and all that other stuff, this is a very light pen. It's very small. Compared to all those other things your worries have influenced, this is nothing. All right? So everybody, worry about this not hitting the floor. Okay? One, two, three. Why didn't it float? How much time do we waste worrying? In fact, I would say that the single greatest waste of time that any human will ever do will be to worry about something happening or not happening. Okay. And yet, we do it all the time. Now, Tom Borkovec, uh, a researcher originally from Chicago, takes a look like this. If this is calm and this is anxious, if you're calm and something bad happens, you jump from here to here. That's a big jump. But what if you're already worrying about the bad thing happening and then it does? Well, now you just jump from here to here. Worry is a buffer. Worry prepares you for the worst case scenario. The problem is, how often do the worst case scenarios actually occur? Very rarely, right, or almost never. We spend a heck of a lot of time worrying about something that almost never occurs. I'll give you a homework assignment tonight to prove my point. When you get home tonight, I want you to grab a fire extinguisher, okay? I want you to get a chair. I want you to sit that chair underneath one of your smoke detectors. I want you to sit in the chair with the fire extinguisher in your hand, and I want you to wait for your house to catch on fire. <laughs> When it does, you will be 100% ready and prepared to put the fire out. Okay? Now, how many of you will do that tonight? Why not? It's a waste of time. So, the things you do worry about are a good use of time, and the things you don't worry about are a huge waste of time. Because here's the interesting thing. We're all discriminators. 
All of us are awful, horrible discriminators. You know why? There's like a million things for us to worry about, and 999,995 of them, we could care less about. But five of them rule our lives. Five things to worry about take control over everything and become the most important thing that we could ever think of. While the other 999,995 things that could do that, we just say, eh, I don't care. That doesn't bother me. Whatever. And each one of us has five different things that we worry about different from the other person who's next to us. I think about when my mom had cancer. Uh, you know, there was, there was the whole process. When she called me, and I remember I was walking out of work and the phone rang and she said, well, I went to the doctor today, they found a lump. My first response was, let's get a good surgeon. I did not say to her, don't worry, you'll be fine, it'll be okay. I never said that to her once, actually. What I said to her, let's get a good surgeon. I said that because a month earlier, her brother had a mastectomy, my uncle, one of about 2,000 men that year who had a mastectomy. Rare, but we've got three people on that side of the family now with right breast, breast cancer, one being male. I check this all the time now, <laughs> I make sure, all right? Now, the whole family, other than a few of us, went through the standard process, which was telling my mom, don't worry, you'll be fine, everything will be okay, there's nothing to worry about. Yes, I know your brother and your sister have already had right breast cancer, and it only happens in 20% of people, and now that you're the third person in the family has it, but it's a fluke, don't worry about it, you'll be fine. And then she goes for the second mammogram, and she says, yep, they found it. And they're like, ah, you know, oh my God. <laughs> and then they say to her, what? Okay, well this time don't worry about it, because when they go to do the next test, everything will be, so then she goes and she does the CAT scan, and they find, uh, they find it in there, and they're all like, ah, and then they say, okay, well, how about the, the, the test, we're gonna, we're gonna put that needle in there, we're going to take that out, we're going we're gonna to test it out. This time they're going to find it's not cancer. Don't worry about everything. We've prayed, we've gone to church, we've done all these things, we've made offerings, all this kind of stuff, and now it'll be okay. She gets the test done. It's cancer. Ah! You know, and they're just like, how can this be? How is this possible? And then there's the, like, the pre-morning period, like she's not even dead yet, but we're looking at her like she's dead, you know. So one day she called me and said, call your father tonight and tell him if he looks at me like I'm going to die one more time, I will punch him in the face. And I said, <laughs> okay, mom, I'll talk to dad. Don't worry, mom. We'll get that taken care of. And then we come to the day of surgery. So I go down to the hospital and I open up my, my laptop and I'm logging on and I'm doing some work emails and just getting stuff done. And and there's family members just you know, pacing, oh my God, what? you know, pacing around. And once in a while they come up to me and they say, what are you doing? I'm doing some work emails. They say, but your mom's in surgery. Yes, I know. That's why I'm at a different hospital than the one I work at. Yes, I'm very aware of that. Well, I, uh, what if something bad happens? And I looked at every one of them and I said, well, what if something good happens? What if, what if she turns out fine? And they looked at me like I had three heads. I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean, what if something good happens? I said, it's just as logical of a choice to think that all's going to go well as it is that it's not. And knowing this doctor and seeing his record, it's a much more logical choice actually to think everything's going to go well than it's not. We didn't pick like butcher guy, all right? <laughs> we picked pretty darn good doctor guy to do the surgery. So um, here's the deal. If it turns out that something bad happens to mom, I've just gotten five hours of work done, and I'll have the same reaction you do within a split second of you do having the reaction when we're told something went wrong. And if everything goes well, I have just gotten five hours of work done, and then I'll go visit her and tell her it's good to see her. You have just wasted five hours of your life and gotten nothing out of it whatsoever. And then they look at me and go, stupid psychologist, they walk away. But. <laughs> What a waste of time it is to worry about this. It does nothing. It helps nobody. And you know what it does to the worrier? It makes you feel restless and keyed up and on edge. You have trouble sleeping. You have trouble focusing. You have trouble concentrating. You have a muscle tension. You're irritable. That's what worry does. Now, there's nothing good out of that. I just rattled off there. That comes out nice out of that. So why do we worry? Again, because we believe we have to prepare ourselves for the worst case scenario. Okay. 
Now, the other reason for worry could be this. Maybe if I could think of every bad thing that might happen, then I can prepare for every bad thing that might happen. And then if I'm prepared for every bad thing that might happen, I won't need to worry about it anymore because I've already prepared for it. So I'll give you a free trip to Hawaii, and you may say, well, thank you. That's totally awesome of you. I appreciate that. That's very nice. Or you might say, well, you know, well, let's think about this for a minute. There could be a plane crash. There might be a fire in the hotel. A shark could eat me. I could drown. Lava. Bad. No good. Kills people. Uh, <laughs> slippery rocks. Waterfall. Break my neck. Helicopter tour. Side of mountain. Crash in mountain. Die. <laughs> Not going to go. Trying to kill me. Staying home. Thanks anyway. All right? And all you've done is thought about how bad everything's going to be. Now, there are some of you in the room who are like this. You are the crazy vacation people. You are the people who spend months doing everything that you can to think of every bad thing that will happen and to prepare for all the things. And your, your, your medical suitcase is just as big as your clothes suitcase is. And then you get there, and for about 10 minutes you enjoy yourself, and then you do this. We've only got five more days here. Oh, my God. <laughs> then I have to go home, and I'll have all these emails to do and all that kind of stuff. And you don't enjoy yourself. Why? Because when you're anxious, what don't you do? You don't live in the moment. That's why. Okay. So you don't relax. You don't have fun. You don't enjoy yourself. Because all you do is think about all the bad things that might happen. And you're trying to always prepare yourself for those so that you're never caught off guard by anything bad actually happening. And it's not a great way to survive your life. My favorite one, specialness. The rules of the world apply to me differently than they do to the other seven and a half or eight billion people who live on the planet. It's okay if bad things happen to other people. It's not okay if they happen to me. I'm special. Very often, people who are anxious live like this. It is fine for everyone else to be here. And to be equal to them, I must be here. This is equal. This is fail. This is equal. And when you live like that, you believe that you're special. You believe the rules of the world apply to you differently than they do to most other people. I'm going to give you a challenge tonight, since you're not going to do the fire extinguisher uh, homework. I will give you a homework to do tonight that I want you to actually do. And then I want you to teach your kids to do these homeworks as well. For the rest of tonight, I want you to treat yourselves as if you were your very best friend in the entire world. Anytime tonight anything goes well, I want you to say to yourself, I rock. That was totally awesome. Nice job. Excellent. Anytime anything goes wrong, I want you to say to yourself, ah, who cares, nobody noticed, it's no big deal, whatever. Those are the very things that you would say to the people you love. Those are the ways that you would treat all of your friends. So I want you to treat yourself like that tonight and see how that feels. Okay? Tomorrow, I want you to do the opposite. Tomorrow, I'd like you to treat everyone you know like you normally treat yourself. Anytime anybody you know does anything wrong tomorrow, go up to them and say, well, that was stupid. I can't believe you did that. You are a moron. You should probably die. And anytime they do anything well, go up to them and say, well, it was luck. It's not like you actually deserved it or anything. Of course, now that something good happens, something bad's bound to happen. Karma. <laughs> good luck. And tomorrow, see if anyone will ever speak to you again for the rest of your life. Since the answer will be no, don't actually do that tomorrow, but hopefully you get the point. We are wonderful at motivating other people, and we are awful at motivating ourselves. How many times have you tried to motivate yourself by reminding yourself of every stupid thing you've ever done in your life? Has that actually helped you? No, it has not. I've seen this with friends. I've been golfing. My buddy Rob hits a shot. Brett says to him, dude, that was a great shot. Brett hits a shot. He puts his ball a foot from Rob's, and he throws his club in the lake. I'm like, what are you doing? You just told him it was a great shot. And what's his answer? Well, it was for him, but not for me. 
Why? Because I live like this. That's why. If this is how we look at things, we fail. Because we're trying to motivate ourselves by reminding ourselves how horrible we are all the time. Well, that's not motivating. Imagine having a niece or a nephew doing a <laughs> piano recital tonight. You would go up to them and say, hey, we've heard you practice. We're so proud of you. We can't wait to hear you play tonight. Have a great recital. This is going to be awesome. We'll go out for ice cream afterwards. It'd be so cool. You wouldn't go up to them and tell them the truth, which is, hey, we've heard you practice. What a waste of money the lessons have been. Uh, we're pretty embarrassed to even be related to you, actually. Uh, we're not going to go. Uh, good luck, though. Um, and uh, we'll, we're going to just go home right now, okay? Now, you would never say that to somebody else. But why do we talk to ourselves like that? Why do we think that that's going to make us better and that's going to be motivating to us? It is not. How are your kids talking to themselves? Are they, are they building themselves up or are they ripping themselves down? Because if they're ripping themselves down, they're not going to improve. Because all they're going to do is think about every stupid thing they've ever done. That doesn't make you better. Motivation is a huge component in this. People get better when they're motivated to change and they're motivated to do things differently. But you're not going to be motivated to do things differently if you only think you're going to fail every time you go to do something. Okay? So it's really important to take a look at this. How do you talk to yourself? Next, neutral. I contend from an anxiety standpoint that everything in the world is neutral. Nothing is anxiety provoking. Nothing is fun. Let's take, for example, an elevator. In front of an elevator, we have three people. Person number one is a four-year-old kid. Person number two, a woman who works in an office building. Person number three, a guy with an elevator phobia. Elevator door opens. What do four-year-old kids do when elevator doors open? They run in and press lots of buttons. Exactly, yeah. What do women who work in office buildings do when elevator doors open? They wait for everybody to get off and then they walk in and then scornfully look at the child because now they have to stop on 12 floors because you pressed all the buttons, right? Okay. What do guys with elevator phobias do when elevator doors open? Back up, take the stairs. Here's our problem. Three people just experienced the exact same thing. The elevator door opening. One thought it was totally awesome. One was absolutely indifferent to it. And one was deathly afraid. How is that possible? The answer is perception. Anxiety is not the fear of a thing. Anxiety is the fear of the way you think about a thing. If you think something's anxiety provoking, it's anxiety provoking. If you think something's fun, it's fun. Things are not fun. Things are not anxiety provoking. It is your perception of those things that lead you to believe that they are fun or anxiety provoking. I have gone bungee jumping. Other people say, no way would I tie a rubber band to my shoe and jump off a perfectly good building. All right. So it's subject to your perception or interpretation. Now, this again is important. We mentioned this a little bit earlier. This is why when somebody is afraid to go to school, I don't go to school and say, all right, now we need to change the color and we need to break this siding and we need to take all the people out and then school will be comfortable. No, we don't do that. What do we do? We change their perception of school. How? We have them go to school and slowly and gradually expose them to it to learn that they can handle being at school and we work with them that way. That's what we do. Okay. So, Let's reverse what we've said. So, we went from should, to can't, to perfect, to control, to special, to neutral, to perception. 
If we reverse that, you get my definition of anxiety, which is if I perceive neutral things in a special way, believing I must control them in order to make them perfect, otherwise I can't handle it and that's the way it should be, I have anxiety. And that's how it works. Okay. So remember, the things that maintain anxiety, avoidance, reassurance, distraction, these are our culprits. These must go. Though they feel good in the short term, they are not good for us in the long run. And we need to switch from what feels good now to what's going to be best for us later. That's the focus that we need. Because we have to get out of this concept that short-term rewards are the best thing for us. They are not. It is the long-term functioning that we're really going to have to focus on here for the people that we're working with. Okay? Therefore, being uncomfortable now can lead to being comfortable later instead of always wanting to be comfortable now, guaranteeing that we'll always be uncomfortable later. All right. So, we went through the model, but are there, as we get toward the end here, are there any other questions or things that people have that I can answer for you? Yes. Yeah, they, and, and the safety-seeking behavior might be occurring in their head. They might be counting or praying or some, some kind of thing to distract themselves while they're doing it. So you won't always see a safety-seeking behavior physically. They can be mental as well, too. So we have to assess for are there any mental kind of safety-seeking behaviors going on. Yeah, yeah, distraction, distraction. So that's why when we do exposures, we don't like to do it for a set amount of time and say, do it for 10 minutes, because then they could just say, all right, I just got 10 minutes, I just got 10 minutes. I say to them, we're going to keep doing this until your anxiety appears to have dropped to about half of what it was when it started. Only then will we stop this. Yes? I mean, in that sense... Getting a shot is not interfering with her life, and she's still going. So if she wants to listen to her iPad while she gets a shot, okay. But that's not to the point of an anxiety disorder interference in her life. If she wouldn't even go to the doctor to get the shot, that's when we're talking about it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. So, like, for, for blood draws for passing out, um, it's interesting to bring that up. There's only two anxiety disorders that lead to passing out, and that is blood or needle phobia. So we actually teach people a very simple technique called applied tension, which is designed to keep your blood pressure up so that you don't actually pass out. It's kind of like along the lines of a flight suit. If you didn't wear a flight suit in a fighter jet, you would pass out because all the blood would rush out of your head into your feet. So you teach people a very similar thing, keeps their blood pressure up, and then they don't pass out anymore. So it's a very simple technique for not passing out. It's not a distraction or anything. It's an actual tool that's used so that you don't fall over. Yes, sir. Can you recap again if, if your child is in the midst of a panic attack or anxiety attack, what is your best thing to at that point in time best to do? So if your child's in the middle of a panic attack, what is the best thing to do? Sit there with them until they calm down and you can then have a discussion about what it was like. Not right then and there, do everything that you can for them to try to make them feel calm because that will introduce all sorts of other things like avoidance and reassurance and distraction, mm -hmm. which then actually will increase the chances of more panic attacks in the future. Okay. Yes? Uh, I mean, we, we take people who have failed at all that stuff in our intensive program all the time and do, you know, three to six hours a day, five days a week with them of intensive social exposure work with them for three or four weeks at a time. 
So it might be that becomes the next thing that you try. I, would, I personally wouldn't shy away from working with that, though. <laughs> but uh, sorry, the use of shy is funny there. <laughs> yes? Um, ah, yeah, yeah, that's a good. Uh huh. Sure. Right. So I would say that, you know, you can earn technology by having friends over or going over to friends' houses. That will be what will earn you some technology. And that way, you know, you don't have to become great friends with them. And <laughs> you know in your head, hopefully they will. But you could say to her, you don't have to become great friends with them, but you at least have to practice interacting with people. Because when you go to high school or college or things like that, there's going to be much more social opportunities and you're going to need to be prepared for those types of things. So avoiding those now won't get you ready for that in the future. So we're just doing this to help you get ready for things in the future. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. It probably won't go into another panic attack, although people will say, oh, I had an hour and a half panic attack. You only have enough adrenaline to have about a 10 minute panic attack and then you've used it all. So you don't have anything really longer than that. So then it might just be some avoidance. I mean, if, and if somebody doesn't necessarily want to talk about it, that's fine. But I, what I want them to do is to do something. I don't want them just going to bed and saying, I've crashed out now or something like that. It's like, all right, your panic attack's done? Okay, great. Let's go, do, let's go to the store then like we were going to do before you had the panic attack. So let's not avoid it. Yes. So that's obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, yeah. So we would have them touch it nine times or 11 times to, to do it wrong and to teach them that they can do things wrong. And once they learn that, then they don't have to do it right if they've been okay doing it wrong. Um, it's an obsession and that behavior becomes a compulsion. Their brain tells them something along the lines of, if you don't do this, something bad might happen, so you have to do it. So in order to make the bad thing not happen, they do it. Yeah. Right, you don't just stop. No. All right, well, that's about our time. So thank you. Um, I brought some of my books, so if anyone's interested and you want to come up and take a look at them, I have them here. And I'll stick around for a little bit if anyone has any other questions or stuff. But thank you all for coming.